Good morning. Well, after many weeks of not being able to meet together face to face, we're hoping that from next week, the 2nd of August, we will be able to gather once again together in church and share fellowship there and have our services a little bit more like we used to. And there will be certain restrictions, of course, and we have to make sure that we're socially distancing and we abide by all the safety procedures. But it will be good to be able to come together and share fellowship again. However, we will still continue to upload the messages here on YouTube. So if, if you're watching and are unable to join us in church or you're watching from perhaps miles away, then uh, you can still pick up the messages on here. Now, before we went into lockdown, I'd started a series on the Beatitudes and I'll be hopefully carrying on with those from next week. So what I thought I'd do for this week is to upload the first in the series that I preached. Um, so it's just an audio file this time, and I will endeavor to upload the other ones which I've um, already preached as well. So they're found in Matthew chapter five, we'll have the reading in a moment. And so far I've preached on the first four Beatitudes, we'll be carrying on next week in church from the fifth one. So please join us for that. But meanwhile, We'll have our reading, which is from Matthew and chapter 5. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We've read together some familiar words there from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. And whenever I read these words, they take me back to when I was about eight or nine years old. We used to belong to a Grace Baptist church back then. It was before we started going to Stanway Evangelical. And at the age of about eight or nine, I had to go to the local memory verse competition, which they had for all the local Grace Baptist churches and children who went to them. And it wasn't so much memory verse as memory passage. We had to memorise a passage of scripture and then recite it in front of everyone. And there was a prize for the one who had remembered it and could recite it the clearest. And this was the passage that I had to remember. And um, early 80s, uh, Grace Baptist Church, of course, I memorised it from the King James Version. Could I recite it now? Not sure, possibly not. Not from memory, not in the, uh, the King James, but I still remember having to learn it for this particular occasion. Well, I'd like us perhaps over the next few Sunday mornings um, when I'm preaching to go through these familiar words from chapter 5, this um, passage which is known as the Beatitudes or the Beautiful Attitudes that have also been referred to. Just to set the scene and by way of an introduction, uh, the Lord Jesus hadn't long started his ministry at this point, but he's already attracting large crowds of followers. He'd begun teaching in synagogues throughout Galilee healing the sick, delivering people from demons, and word was spreading about him. His reputation was spreading amongst people. People wanted to come together and see just who this man was. They were interested in what he had to say. So by the end of chapter 4, we read that crowds of people had gathered, and we can see they came from miles around. Not just local people, but people came from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, across the Jordan... And you can imagine the crowds of people there, all eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus, keen to hear what he was going to teach them, what he was going to say to them. And the Lord, on seeing the, mount, uh, the crowd, goes up on a mountainside to deliver this great message that we know as the Sermon on the Mount. 
goes on to um, fill three chapters of Matthew's Gospel, from Matthew 5 up to Matthew chapter 7. It's always good to hear a sermon with something that challenges us, something that we can take away and think about. And there's certainly plenty here in the Sermon on the Mount for the Lord's listeners to be challenged by and to take away with them. Now, we don't know the exact location of the mountainside, we're not told, but it was very probably close to the Sea of Galilee. But the fact that the Lord went up onto the mountain is significant. Now, yes, he probably went up on there because up higher than the crowd, people would have been able to see him, to look up to him, and also his voice would have projected better over the crowds of people so everyone could listen. But I believe there's another significance here as well. See, when the Lord... God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. Moses went up the mountain to receive them. Now the Lord Jesus is about to teach some important truths to people. And again he goes up on a mountain before giving people these new directions, these new instructions on how to live in a way that glorifies God, both outwardly and inwardly, with their hearts and with their attitudes. So the Lord Jesus gives these teachings from the mountainside. And we read that he goes up the mountain and sits down. And it was customary in those days for a rabbi, when he was teaching, to sit. But what did people think of his teaching? What did people really think about the things that he was saying? Well, there were almost certainly Pharisees and teachers of the law amongst the crowds. And they wouldn't have been impressed by the things that they heard. And yet at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7... The, um, verses 28 and 29, we read this. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Yes, the Lord Jesus taught with authority. He taught with divine authority. And yes, people listened to the teachers of the law back in those days because they were the ones who went into the temples and taught people what the law said. But very often they would quote each other to support their teachings, to sort of give more authority to the words that they said. The Lord Jesus didn't need to do this. He taught with authority because he was his own authority. He didn't need the words of other men to back him up, although yes, he did go back and quote um, parts of the Old Testament. But of course, we know that's all the word of God. But the words he taught were the very words of God himself, because that's who the Lord Jesus was and is. And his words hit home far deeper than the teachers of the law. Now, when I preach, yes, I sometimes quote from other preachers and from commentators, but my first and my last source of reference must always be right here, the word of God. That's the most important thing. It's his words, not just what somebody else has written or said about the Bible. So the Lord Jesus starts these teachings, this great sermon, with these nine sentences here the Beatitudes. Nine little sentences that proclaim blessing and reward for certain conditions, but they seemingly go against the thinking of the day, and certainly of our day as well. See, God's ways are not always the ways of the world. And in this dog-eat-dog competitive world in which we live, where people are so often looking out for number one, looking out for what they can get for themselves, you have to be tough to survive. Actually, these teachings very often go against the attitudes of the world and how we're told that normal people should live. The Beatitudes have also been called divine paradoxes because in some cases the conditions should not naturally or logically lead to the benefits. So what does it mean, Beatitude? Well, the word Beatitude comes from the Latin word Beatus, which means happy or fortunate or joyful or blessed. And in some of the translations of the Bible, we read it um, put this way. Happy are, happy are the poor in spirit, happy are those who mourn, happy are those who are empty, who are hungry, for they shall be filled. I don't think that really conveys the true meaning of what the Lord Jesus is saying here. Because people look for happiness in all different areas of life. And people can find it for a time. Happiness in work, in relationships, in particular events. But this happiness can fade. Happiness really is just a state of mind. I prefer what the um, New International Version and what the King James Version say, blessed, blessed are. What's the difference? What does blessed really say that um, happy doesn't? What do we mean? 
Well, blessed simply means this. If we're blessed, then we have God's approval or God's favour on our lives. If we follow these instructions given within the Beatitudes, as well as the other teachings that we find in Scripture, if we walk in God's ways, he will smile on us. We will be truly blessed. It's not something that's affected by how we feel, but it's knowing how we are before God. It's not a temporary happiness, but a deeper joy. That blessedness is more deep, more permanent than just happiness. So this morning then, after that little introduction, I'd like us to look at the first of the Beatitudes, which is this, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Lord says here that we will be blessed if we are poor in spirit. What does he mean? Well, let's start off then. Blessed are the poor. When we think about the word poor, it generally has negative connotations. We perhaps think of somebody who's ill, or who has a disability, or who's reached an age where they can't do the things that they used to, and perhaps need a bit of extra care to look after them, and we say, ah, poor them. It can lead to a loss of independence. They have to look to others to help them. Poor also signifies poverty. We think of those who lack material possessions, money, food. Think of the homeless. Think of those in other countries where there is famine or a low standard of living. And as we know, many in our world today, both in the UK and abroad, suffer the effects of poverty. The term poor is a negative one. Nobody wants to be poor. But the Lord doesn't say, blessed are the poor and stop there. No. Because we can have good health and rejoice in it. We can have material possessions and money. That's not forbidden in scripture. But what about our attitudes towards what we have and where it came from in the first place? See, we need to acknowledge that all that we have and all that we are comes from our God. It's what he's chosen to bless us with. I'm in fairly good shape, reasonably, health-wise, but I can't take all the credit. I may eat sensibly and I may get more exercise than I used to, but we heard the news this morning that someone who's only a couple of years older than me has died over the weekend of a heart attack. Our health, our very lives can be taken from us in the blink of an eye. What about wealth? We're not stony broke. We've been born in what's materially a very well-off country. And Karen and I are both hard workers. We've both been brought up to save. And I'd say that, okay, we're fairly financially secure. But what if my business suddenly failed? Karen's job at the moment is looking very uncertain. We're not sure how that's going to pan out. And what if we were suddenly faced with a huge expense that we had to pay? For people in our country, generally, how is Brexit going to affect what they have? People in the Bahamas, as we were praying, have lost everything in the wake of that terrible hurricane. So although I don't consider myself to be in poor health or wealth-wise at the moment, I won't boast that it's all my doing. It's not. What I have is because God has been gracious to me and blessed me. And we should all say that ourselves when we look at what we have. It's because of what the Lord has given us what the Lord has blessed us with and we should give him the glory for that and if these blessings are withdrawn at any time for any reason we have to accept that whatever the reason that's God's will for our lives and he has a deeper purpose to teach us through that but as I say he doesn't stop at blessed are the poor what he says is blessed are the poor in spirit So he's not talking about the poor in the sense of health and wealth. And yes, we can all have qualities or possessions that can commend us to the world in general, the secular world, if you like. I've got nearly 30 years experience in accountancy, and hopefully I can provide a fairly good accountancy service for people. And that's something that commends me to potential clients. But the Lord here is talking about what we have, what we can use to commend ourselves to him. And what do we have? Nothing. We have nothing. The word for poor here in verse 3, if you went back to the original Greek, was a word that was used to describe a beggar. Someone on their knees, cringing, holding out their hands, asking for help. In other words, someone who hasn't got that self-sufficiency, who's got no pride in themselves, but recognises their need and their need of assistance. And then we add the words in spirit. It shows that the person who recognises the fact that they are sinful, that they're unworthy, they've got nothing of their own that they can commend themselves to God with. All they can do is hold out their hands in total humility and seek his forgiveness. 
Being poor in spirit means that we realise just what we lack. We have a holy God, a perfect God, a God who cannot bear to look on sin. And we are sinful people. We have nothing with which we can commend ourselves to him. All we can do is humbly come before him and seek his forgiveness. Top lady puts it this way in Rock of Ages. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to this fountain fly. Wash me saviour or I die. John Wesley describes it this way. He or she who has a deep sense of the loathsome leprosy of sin, which he brought from his mother's womb, which overspreads his whole soul and totally corrupts every power and faculty thereof. Someone who realises in the sight of God and biblically speaking just who we are. Simply this, it's a recognition of personal, moral, spiritual unworthiness. Yes, we may have health, we may have wealth, we may have intellect, we may have abilities. On our own, they won't help us to get to heaven. One translation of this verse puts it this way. Blessed are those who realise that they have nothing within themselves to commend them to God. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And you see, as we know, this is the beginning of a person's conversion. That realisation, that acknowledgement of, of an imperfect, sinful life. Because the Bible makes it very clear that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that the wages of sin is death. And none of us can claim to be exempt from this. We can live good lives. We can be good people. We can be loving towards others. Give to charity. But it's not enough. All our righteous acts are as filthy rags. They won't get us to heaven. So each of us, spiritually speaking, is broke. We're poor. We're spiritually bankrupt. And when we realise that, then we are poor in spirit. We hold out our hands to the Lord and just simply ask him for his forgiveness. Paul said this in Galatians 6, May I never boast, and he was a man who had plenty he could boast about, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the Lord Jesus knew that there were those who were certainly not poor in spirit. As I said, very probably some of them were there listening to him speak, listening to him deliver the Sermon on the Mount. The Pharisees, the teachers of the law, those who were so full of themselves and their own self-importance, they considered themselves to be at the front of the queue for heaven because of who they were. But what does the Lord Jesus say about them? In Matthew 23, do not do what they do, they do not practice what they preach. Everything they do is for, done for people to see. They love the place of honour at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. They love to be seen to be the spiritual giants, yet their self-righteousness was their downfall. They were unrighteous deep down in their hearts. Nothing is hidden from God. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God sees the hearts. And however impressive they may have looked to other people, the Lord knew their hearts. Another example is the two men praying in the temple from Luke chapter 18. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. You see, that tax collector demonstrated just what it means to truly be poor in spirit, unlike the Pharisee. Likewise, we need to humble ourselves before God. Be aware that we are imperfect. But having said all this and emphasised the point, I also want to emphasise that we should never feel so unworthy that we believe that we're worthless. We're not. Being poor in spirit does not mean that we completely write ourselves off as of no value. And as I said to the children earlier on with that bit of wood that was turned into that beautiful violin, God looks at us 
We are special to him. He sees the potential. He knows the potential. And in his hands, we can be turned into something beautiful that can live and can work for him. Now, what I've spoken about so far really deals with the Christian at conversion. But we also need to retain this spirit of humility throughout our Christian lives. It can be easy for us to get puffed up or full of ourselves. I have in the past known some experienced Christians who have got a little bit of that in themselves. Who, rather than lead less experienced Christians along gently, have taken a very hand, heavy-handed approach. Sort of the, well, I've been a Christian for longer than you, so listen to what I say and do it. Shouldn't be like that at all. We should always retain a humble spirit, recognising that who we are is because of God's grace. Only by grace can we enter. That's what we sang, didn't we? Wonderful grace that gives what I don't deserve. It's all about God's grace. And if we're going to boast about anything, let's boast about the Lord. Boast in the Lord and what he is doing through us. So what's the reward? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, first of all, there's another reward if we go back a few words. If we're poor in spirit, we are blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. We found favour in the eyes of God, and that's a wonderful thing in itself. Aaron takes a pride in pleasing us, most of the time. But if he's done well at school and he gets a house point, he's very proud to come home and tell us that he's got a house point. Or we'll see it on the, the app that comes up on the phone and says that he's, he's earned a house point for doing something. He's very pleased to tell us about it because he knows that we will be pleased with him as well. He'll have found favour in our eyes. Well, if we live lives of obedience to God, we find favour in the eyes of God. And here Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. If we're poor in spirit, as I've been explaining, then God will be pleased with us. But then look at the reward that we're promised. The kingdom of heaven. See, this is where I say that some of these Beatitudes go against logical thought. If you're poor, you've got nothing. And yet it says here, you've got the kingdom of heaven. If you're poor in spirit, then you're not as righteous as the Pharisees. So how could you even expect to get to heaven, let alone inherit the kingdom? But actually, if we are poor in spirit, if we acknowledge that of ourselves we have and are nothing, then we stand to gain everything. Look at the words. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The first and the eighth beatitude both carry this reward, the kingdom of heaven. But they stand out from all the other beatitudes in one important respect. The others are all in the future tense. They will be comforted. They will inherit the earth. They will be filled, etc. This one says, theirs is. It's in the present tense. The Matthew's Gospel is the only place in scripture that talks about the kingdom of heaven in those words. Other places refer it to it as heaven or the kingdom of God. But as believers, this kingdom is ours, which is an amazing promise. And at the moment that we become Christians, we become part of that kingdom. The eternal kingdom, which has always been and which will always be. There's a tendency perhaps to think that our eternal life starts when we get to heaven, and it doesn't. It starts at that moment of salvation. Listen to what Paul writes in Philippians 3, verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven. Not will be, but is. From that moment when we become God's children, part of God's family, we're guaranteed that glorious inheritance, the kingdom of heaven. And it is ours. And 1 Peter chapter 1 says this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. How wonderful. That everlasting inheritance. God's everlasting kingdom. And heaven's going to be wonderful. It really is. Don't know what life is like for you at the moment. Maybe you're going through a good time. Maybe you're going through a difficult time. I'll be honest, at the moment I'm struggling a bit with life and feel like I'm going through some quite dark days. But we are citizens of heaven and we can hold on to that promise and we can find comfort from it. Maybe life is going well, but even the very best time that we can enjoy on this earth will be nothing compared to the joy that we'll experience when we're up in heaven. And it's going to go on and on and on for eternity. We can't comprehend just how wonderful heaven will be. 
but it will be possible not because of what we've done, not because of who we are, not because of anything we have, but all because of God's grace and love. So in summary then, blessed are the poor in spirit. What are we trusting in this morning? What's our focus? Are we trusting in ourselves, our own qualities, our possessions and our health too much? Or maybe even other people? Or are we fixing our eyes upon the Lord Jesus? Acknowledging that all we have and all we are comes from him. Maybe this morning you're here and you've never really fully comprehended that. Or maybe you've never quite felt good enough to come before God. And if that's true, come before him today. Acknowledge our shortcomings. Repent of your sin because he's a gracious, loving God who longs to forgive. Who longs people to turn to him in repentance. Give new life. And if you've been a Christian for some time, then rejoice once again at the joy of knowing Christ is your saviour. Let's give him the glory for all that he's done and for all that he continues to do in our lives. Let's pray. Yes, Father God, we thank you that if we are indeed poor in spirit, if we remember that of ourselves we are nothing, but in you we can be everything and we have everything then we, we have that great promise that we are blessed and that ours is the kingdom of heaven. Lord, it can be very easy for us to look at the things that we have, the things that are around us and put our faith and our trust in them, but it's futile. Help us to be people of faith, people whose eyes are fixed upon you, knowing that uh, you are the great provider, you are the only one in whom salvation can be found. And we have that great promise of eternal life in heaven if we trust in you. Lord, may we be able to take... Um, steps into this week remembering that holding on to the great promise stepping out in faith and living for you in jesus name amen a lady called charlotte elliott was visiting some friends in the west end of london there she met the eminent minister caesar milan while seated at supper the minister said that he hoped that she was a christian she took offense at this and replied that she would rather not discuss that question Dr. Milan said that he was sorry if he had offended her and that he always liked to speak a word for his master and he hoped that the young lady would someday become a worker for Christ. When they met again at the home of a mutual friend three weeks later, Charlotte Elliott told the minister that ever since he had spoken to her, she had been trying to find her saviour and that she now wished him to tell her how to come to Christ. Just come to him as you are, Dr. Milan said. This she did and went away rejoicing. And shortly afterwards, she wrote this lovely hymn with which we'll close this morning. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thou, thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Let's stand together as we close with this.